friends. Today we're checking out Lance's homestead in western Colorado. He's been gardening the high desert for over 40 years. He produces 95% of his food on just three quarters of an acre. And today he's going to give us a tour and share his secrets. Let's go. Lance Swigert. This is Hotchkiss, Colorado. A little over 6,000 feet in the Rocky Mountains. High desert. I originally came from uh, Southern California, San Clemente. And I was a beach bum at that time. I had some relatives that moved here and I came out to visit and I liked it. So my mother and I bought this property in the fall of uh, 79. And the garden got started in 1987. That's when we drilled a well. We did have some irrigation water here, but it wasn't enough. So um, drilled a well and that works really good. <music> So this garden got started in 1987 and it was just cheat grass and it was a desert. There was no, nothing here. And this is, this year, this is uh, winter squash and the, the nasturtiums. This is volunteer datura, a jimson weed. Some people call it moonflower. This. And you can see the seed pods on it, <laughs> grenades. But it's a very sweet smelling flower in the evening. The nasturtiums, I know people would love to have those nasturtiums to eat. Yeah, you eat the flowers. Eat them raw. Yep. They'll possibly be a little spicy. Yeah, it's not bad. Yeah. It'd be good in a salad. Mm -hmm. This is uh, a couple rows of what's called pearl millet. And uh, lots of people are actually using this for bird seed, uh, but I'm going to eat this. And it also will go into my homemade bread. Uh, this is Anasazi beans right here in front. Farther on is Hutterite soup beans. The other spot over there with the buckwheat was uh, Kamut. Kamut is a type of ancient wheat and it's a spring planted wheat. It's not a winter wheat. So what does that mean? Winter grains are planted in the fall. They germinate and then they survive the winter and then they grow and produce. A spring wheat is planted in April and it will be ready in July, early August. And then you got your summer grains, which millet is a lot like corn. And you can't plant that till after danger of frost. We got melons here. That's a type of cantaloupe, a heogen. It's a Middle Eastern melon with uh, green flesh. I'm not a huge fan of tomatoes, so I got a few plants. I dry them and cook with them. No canning. I always wanted to just grow food, so here I am. Little by little, and when I started, I was doing your typical stuff. I was actually buying plants and buying seeds. And then as things went along, one of the cover crops that I had, a rye cover crop, it got way far ahead of me. It was starting to make seed heads. So, well, let's just let this go and see how hard it is to grow grain. That's how I learned how to start growing grain. Oh, let's see about growing things for seed. And then you learn how to grow seed and uh, stuff. And we did at one time have a very knowledgeable seed growing collector here in the area. I learned a lot about seed saving and got a lot of different varieties of stuff from him. He'd give me a little tablespoon of say the uh, turkey red wheat. I got a tablespoon. Now I have 10, 10 or 15 gallons. Cucumbers and delicata squash and some zucchini up there. And again, all of this is my own seed. I've grown it all from seed. This is all blue corn here. Eight, nine feet tall, the tops of those, but it's still drying out. It hasn't been watered for two, three weeks. There's your blue corn. Look at all the earwigs still, but they're not hurting nothing. And what do you do with the corn? You turn it into flour? I will make polenta is the main thing, flour. And these kind of corns, the flour corns, you toast them before you grind them. So you have a toasted corn flavor. And I'll store them on the cobs because they'll store way better. And I only take it off when I need to make some. And you can make corn flour out of that too. Um, it, they're soft. What's, what's your secret to corn? Because I know so many people have a hard time with it. Make your rows, water it, get the ground moist, plant the corn down in that moisture and don't water it till they come up. Because we have a tendency to water too much and they will rot in the ground. And also if you wait till the soil temperature is 65 or higher, 70, 75 is great. Don't plant it early. This is a uh, pole bean and it's actually a friend of mine. It's actually a family heirloom of hers. It's called the Littlefield bean. 
And this is a potato patch right here where you see the white buckwheat blooming down there. That was the early potatoes. Just turned around and planted. And you know, we let that buckwheat this time of year, the insects have very few pollinating plants or pollen. They're really working that a lot. Uh, there's German butterballs. Oh, I heard about these. And there's a uh, rose fin apple. You save your seed? Uh, potatoes are a little bit more difficult. These here were my own potatoes and I marked them with steak so that I know which ones I actually bought. Now this variety down here, you can see my steaks. Those are seed potatoes that I bought. This is seed potatoes that I saved. We have a windbreak. I always liked the idea of a hedge grow. So I bought a bunch of seeds. I think it was 150 plants. I have the choke cherry and the Russian caragana. Then I added in here lilacs. There's hedge roses, the Austin copper rose, the Persian yellow, Nankin cherry, Eastern red cedar. That over there is a gamble oak. It's a perfect wildlife. Yeah. They stay away from your food crops. Yeah. And uh, it's a windbreak, privacy break. You know, it creates its own space here. Oh, there's even a sour cherry that I don't know where it came from. There's four varieties in each bed. And this bed is Nantes, Red Corps Chantonnays, Danvers, and a French Diocene. And I harvest a little bit of each variety, so I got a mix. These are the Chantonnays, classic, just broad, fat things. They do pretty good in this soil as it is. So we just had some, some rain. And when the soil's moist, it pretty much just comes right out of the ground. And then what I'll do when I get this full is I um, fill the bucket with water, another bucket with water, which I'll rinse with, and then another bucket is uh, a drain. I drain them in, and then I bag them. <laughs> What would you tell someone that's young in their 20s about this lifestyle? Like, how did it all develop? How did you get started? Uh, my mother and I actually bought this property. If you're really gonna go for it, decide what you'd like to eat and uh, learn how to grow it. Nothing in this garden is strictly for sale. It's because I like to eat it. So decide what you wanna eat and learn how to grow it and then you can go from there. Your health is way better at this end than what most people think. In fact, I still have stayed in contact with all my old friends in Southern California, and I'm the only one still going at it. They're retired, they're doing stuff, but... <laughs> it's totally, yeah, totally different. You, totally different. And these are all the different grapes. Suffolk red here. So this, these get a little bit riper. And I still have a few things like this. This is the hemrod. Those are gonna be really good, those hemrods, because they're ripe two weeks out. And that's a seedless. There's still a few hanging on there. Wow. <laughs> yeah, they're really good. And then the next batch to ripen as ready is the candice. And these things are they're really quite a pretty great cluster. You can see those. And this needs to be a little bit more purple. But see right next to it, there's a little bit darker. And then you have Niagara's grapes. It's not warm enough, but when you when these start to ripen, uh, they start to it perfumes the air. It smells just like a flower blooming. I have a friend that's gonna come pick these this weekend to make wine out of those. I don't know what those are, but I know they're not ripe. They came out of a vineyard that it was like a pollinator, but I know that they still got two weeks to go. And they're really good too. This is a Swensons, and you have a Delaware, and that's a good grape. The Delaware would be good for uh, making jam or jelly. Tight clusters, and again, they all have seeds, so you'd have to press it, press the juice out, strain it, and then do whatever you do after that. And the trellis you made, how did you make that? That uh, is a wood trellis, a juniper post, and that's actually choke cherry. And what people don't realize is the plants do not like metal. It's too hot. And we use metal because it's durable. And it works, but the plants like the wood better. You know, so that's what that is. And it's fun. About every five years, I rebuild these trellises. This is choke cherry, but if it's willow, it really breaks down after about that much. This is uh, sunflowers. This is Taramara whites and I'm growing it out for a seed crop. And they got so heavy, I actually put a T-post in there to hold them up. A lot of weight there, and they'll get you know 10 or 12 feet tall, and then once they start forming those seed heads, they bend over like this. I was surprised that it wasn't the bees that pollinated, it was the bumblebees that came in here. 
and all different types of bumblebees. And they were collecting a lot, a lot of pollen. The birds haven't gone after it yet, but I will have to net this. And I have the bird netting for it, just to slow them down. That's the early Alberta. So they're almost ready. And normally you don't want a tree to be tall like that because that's all ladder work. But for some reason, these lower branches, they died. What to say, that's what happened. At least I've got a tree still. And did you purposely thin these guys out or? I thin these to a certain degree. Many people can't do that. But if you don't thin, you might have heard that fruit go to every other year. One year is a heavy crop. It's so heavy the tree can't make fruiting spurs for next year. The next reason is if you want a little bit bigger fruit. These didn't have to be too much. So these are actually huge for a peach. Can't even fit in my fist. I just picked these the other day. This is Italian prune plum. And I said, when the birds start to go after it, and if you can look in there, that's been bird pecked and stuff. So I said, okay, time to harvest these. Doesn't feel like we're in the high desert of Colorado. No, no, over 6,000 feet, something like that. And this was just a big flower bed. There's still some zinnias and cosmos and the pink flower is Lavateria. This is just for flowers? This is all just for flowers. Eventually there's an English walnut over here and that will take over the entire area, but that's 10 years, 15 years down the road. Nasturtiums, um, this is what I grew up with in Southern California and they can grow, you know, 15 feet or so. And they really like the cooler weather, so now they're really going to town. And this is a type of sweet pea that smells really good. Oh, wow, yeah. They smell really good in the middle of the afternoon when it's hot. That's when they smell the best. And what's this ground cover here? Oh, uh, that's yarrow. So we're just walking on a field of yarrow? Yeah, and if you keep it mowed, it is the greatest lawn. It's soft, it's, you know, it's way better than grass. How big is this garden space? It's about three quarters of an acre. And it does 90% of your food. There's so much food here, it's, it's phenomenal. And I sell stuff out of here too. If you stay on top of it, you can do a lot. I could actually grow more food in here if I really wanted to. And maybe when I really retire from landscaping, maybe I will. What made you believe that you could make a giant garden in a desert? I mean- I did, could... I just started doing it. I was an athlete. And you just take that same energy, you have physical energy and determination and stuff, and you just start doing it. And you just observe things and observe how things are going on. And I also have a lot of physical endurance. And so I just keep going. I can peck away at something for months. And how have you seen the soil change? Because like, the soil is red outside. Of red and clay, and it's brown in here. Yeah, just, uh, and it's much easier to work, you know? And it, if I stop using compost or any type of organic fertilizer, it'd go right back to clay within a year or two. It'd be, maybe it wouldn't be red, but it's, uh, it would go right back to clay. That's just the nature of it. And I actually like clay soils. You know, the trick is that it, uh, is to get the organic matter in there so you can work it. Because clay has all the nutrients that you can want. If I'm right, it's only zinc that's not quite here and, and the right amount. But otherwise, it's, it's good soil. This is all composting area. Everything that's organic goes in this. It takes about six weeks on these piles. The dark stuff on top just got shredded yesterday. This is probably three or four piles of shredded compost. But a regular pile out there takes six weeks. And then I store all the waste products until I'm making a pile in there. So you can see there's some squash in there, and hay, and there's even some two big cucumbers, weeds. It's all done by hand. And all my gray water from the kitchen sink goes onto the compost. It's really the only source of uh, organic matter you know, that I use. And I've never had any soil test. <laughs> anything of the sort. This is where our, all the seeds are. This is Kamut and you can leave it on those stalks. And all the seeds you see here are from my garden. These buckets are full of carrots, Swiss chard, beets, cilantro, all the lettuce. Here's your bucket of lavateria, the pink mallow out there. There's that and I'll clean that all out there. This is the carrots. There's two and a half buckets of carrots. 
carrot seed and then those all dry beans and grains and all that kind of stuff. Winter squash, melons. So you save all your seed? Mm -hmm. I don't buy any seed unless there's something new coming along. And I'm not really looking. People bring me seed. Hey, let's try this. And so the first thing I do is try to grow it out for seed. See if it, if it does anything here. So you've been doing this for 40 years? At least, yeah. So these varieties are 40 years adapted. These grains are not so much, but soon to be. And they get adapted and they just grow. So that's part of the success. The seeds are adapted to growing in the conditions I've got here. This whole bed was the early crop. And then you turn around and come back and I plant a late crop. So I got snap peas that are blooming. Snow peas are a little slower. They actually don't like the heat as much. So they take their time. And then you have some more kohlrabi and then have four types of beets in there. Finocchio and two different types of spinach in here. One's called, uh, well, one's uh, winter Bloomsdale. And you can see the size. Most people are eating spinach really small. Well, look at the, this is not a big leaf of this. This is getting close. I like letting them get big. These crops, when you plant them in the spring, they just die because it gets hot. In the fall, they just keep growing. And this will actually survive a frost. This is a German Lutz beet. I don't know how big they are down in there. They're not too big yet. You can't find the seed commercially anymore. In the seed industry or the food industry, something goes out of vogue and it disappears. And we've actually lost about, I think it's 90% of our food crops because of the modern seed and agriculture and stuff. I took it to the seed swap in Peonia in March and people just went nuts because you can't get it. This is a beet. And as you can see, it's actually grown more for the greens, beet greens than the actual root. But the roots can get about this big, which is a perfect size beet. Oh, wow. Then there's golden beets. And it has a little bit of gold in the leaf. This is the Chiogia beet. That's a pink and white. And then the regular, or standard Detroit dark red. And you see it has the red. And all these greens are good to eat. Where can people find more information about you? The only place that you can really reach me is at the, our um, public radio station. We do a live call-in garden talk show. And uh, it's called As the Worm Turns, Tuesday evenings, 6 to 7, uh, kvnf.org. Or you can actually listen live that way. Anyways, Tank, this will be interesting. I'm being interviewed. <laughs> okay, go relax someplace.